truth in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. So to continue baptism, who can receive baptism? Well, every person not yet baptized and only such a person is able to be baptized. We know that there are three sacraments that imprint an indelible mark, a seal, a character on the soul. Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. And so only someone who hasn't been baptized before can be baptized. Baptism of adults in the beginning was the norm. For the baptism of adults, the training of the catechumens becomes extremely important because baptism is a sacrament of faith. And so faith is something that normally precedes baptism in an adult. So we have to catechize people. These people should be initiated into the faith, the liturgy, the prayer, the charity of the church. Now, from the earliest years, infants were also, no doubt, baptized. We hear in the Acts of the Apostles, sometimes entire households were baptized. And probably that included the infants. Number 1250 in the Catechism speaks of the baptism of infants. Born with the fallen human nature and tainted by original sin, children also have need of the new birth and baptism in order to be freed from the power of darkness and brought into the realm of the freedom of the children of God, to which all men are called. The sheer gratuitousness of the grace of salvation is particularly manifest in infant baptism. The church and the parents would deny a child the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confer baptism shortly after birth. And so the church and the parents certainly don't want to deny any child the grace of becoming a child of God. And so we confer baptism upon infants as soon as possible. I was baptized when I was 10 days old. June 1st is the anniversary of my baptism. And I always celebrate it because that, that's a great day. The day we're baptized is a wonderful day. That's the day we're born again, so to speak. We're born again in Christ were raised to a new and higher life. As I said, baptism is a sacrament of faith, but faith needs the community of believers. It is only within the faith of the church that each of the faithful can believe. That's why we love the church so much. You know, I, I can't believe without the faith of the church preceding my act of faith. I'm so thankful that I was born into a Catholic family that my mother and father and grandparents believed. They had the faith. Well, the belief of my parents and relatives and the belief of all the church, the parish community, that preceded my belief. It came before me and it helped me. In a sense, our mother, the church, gives birth to the life of faith in every soul. Now, the faith required for baptism isn't a perfect faith, the Catechism teaches us, or a mature faith. It is a faith that has to develop. We don't expect that someone just being, baptism, being baptized has to be a theologian, luckily. But even for an infant, 
faith is necessary. Not in the infant, of course, because without the use of reason, the infant can't give the assent of faith. But through the parents and the godparents, we give that assent of faith for the little ones. Now, who can baptize? You see how the catechism is proceeding with all these when, how, who, basic things, basic questions to help us in a simple way to understand the faith. Well, the ordinary ministers of baptism in the Latin rite or the Western church are the bishop and the priest and the deacon. That's in the Latin rite, our rite, most of us. Most of us are in the Latin rite. So the bishop, the priest, and the deacon are the ordinary ministers of baptism. In the East, the bishop and the priest, not the deacon, are the ordinary ministers of baptism. Now, we know that in case of necessity, anyone can baptize. I remember my mother telling me, my mother was a registered nurse for many years, and she told me that when she was in nurses' training back then, they, they taught the nurses, they taught the student nurses that if a baby was being born, they're in trouble, you know, the baby was, uh, maybe the umbilical cord was wrapped around the neck or there was a danger of, of death and the uh, mother was Christian, not just Catholic, but Christian, that they were to baptize right on the spot. And so my mother said she remembers uh, a certain uh, lady doctor who, who was uh, delivering a baby, and that child uh, was not stillborn, but, but about to expire. I don't remember what was wrong, but the doctor knew it, and the baby took like a gasp. They, wasn't, they weren't sure if the baby had died on delivery, but they saw the baby take a gasp, one breath, and the doctor grabbed um, a container of water just poured it right on the baby's eye, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the baby did die then. It took one more breath, and that was it. So they were taught in those days to do things like that. So in case of emergency, anyone, even a non-Christian, can baptize as long as they intend to do what the church does. What does the church intend to do? Baptize. Baptize. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit while pouring water. Baptize. Well, the pagan might not know what baptism means, but they know maybe that, that this family is, is Christian. Well, I want to do what the Christians do. I want to help this person. They have the intention to do what the church does. They have the form and the matter. The form, the words, the matter, the pouring of water. Valid sacrament. And so in case of emergency, any of us can baptize. The necessity of baptism. Well, the church has always taught that baptism is necessary for salvation. The Lord himself affirms that baptism is necessary for salvation, number 1257. Baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament. The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. Now, I have, I believe, talked about this once before. Baptism is necessary for salvation, yes. The ordinary means of baptism is sacramental baptism, baptism with water, the sacrament. However, we know that there are two other ways that you can receive the fruits of baptism. Number 1258 speaks of that. Baptism of desire and baptism of blood. The church has always held the firm conviction that those who suffer death for the sake of the faith without having received baptism are baptized by their death for and with Christ. All right, so the holy innocents come to mind. Remember when Herod was hunting down all the male children searching for this king of Israel, and he had all the male children under two years, I think, murdered, holy innocence. Well, if a person, let's say, in a country that doesn't allow freedom of religion, uh, there are places still in the world where you, you really can't proselytize, you can't evangelize. Uh, I have 
a friend who's a missionary priest in India. There are certain places in Pakistan and certain provinces in India where you can't engage in active evangelization. Uh, you could be imprisoned and even the death penalty for that. Uh, so let's say someone were to stick up for the Christian faith, were to defend Jesus and defend that religion, that faith, and they weren't even a baptized person, say a Hindu, but who had in their heart a sense that this Jesus is really special, that this is, is what the Christians say, and that person then were killed for their belief. There's a certain baptism of blood that takes place. That's an extraordinary means. It's not sacramental baptism, but that baptism of blood applies the fruit of baptism and the person is saved through that baptism with blood. Baptism of desire is another way. We know that catechumens who are studying the faith, getting ready, ready to be received into the faith, if they were to be to die or be killed before they actually receive sacramental baptism, their desire to be baptized is an explicit, or at least an implicit, indication that they desire baptism. And that baptism of desire would apply the fruits of the sacrament. They wouldn't have received the sacrament of baptism, but they could be saved through that baptism of desire. And so baptism with water, the sacrament, is the ordinary means. But there are two extraordinary means, baptism of blood and baptism of desire, by which a person can be saved. Now, we know that everyone, God wills everyone to be saved. Scripture says so. God wills not the death of the sinner. The sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what about pagans? What, what about people who, you know, they, they just don't have a chance? Maybe out in some far-off land, never heard the gospel, never saw a missionary. Well, what about them? Well, number 1260 talks about that. Every man who is ignorant of the gospel of Christ and of his church, but seeks the truth. Now, note what it says. But seeks the truth and does the will of God in accordance with his understanding of it, can be saved. It may be disposed that such persons would have desired baptism explicitly if they had known its necessity. So, you have someone out in the jungles of Borneo, never heard of Jesus Christ, never had a missionary come, but the person hears that voice of conscience within them, that voice of conscience which every human being has it inscribed in the depth of their heart, do good, avoid evil. And so that person listens to the voice of conscience, and such as they know how, they, be, they do good, and they avoid evil. That person even though they have not had the grace of baptism, even though they never heard of Christ, because they are responding to the voice of God, which comes through conscience, that person can be saved in a way and in a number known only to God. We don't know how, and we don't know how many such people. We don't, it's a mystery. But the church teaches that that's possible. So we're not to despair of anyone's salvation, however... That is not to be used as a flabby excuse for not engaging in missionary activity. The church knows of no other ordinary means of salvation other than baptism. Those other things are extraordinary. God can do that. God has given us the sacraments and generally speaking, ordinarily, requires us to be bound by that observance, but God is not bound by that. He can operate in an extraordinary manner. And his mercy, I believe, allows him or almost impels him to operate sometimes in that extraordinary manner. Your prayers, your life of penance and sacrifice, your holy life, your life of virtue brings down grace on the whole church. And through the church, that grace goes out to people that you have never seen. Some poor person suffering from cancer in a hospital, some good Christian, uniting themselves with the cross of Christ, 
brings down grace on the pagan out in the jungle somewhere who never heard of Jesus. And there's an interior movement of the spirit. And that person moves towards the good and rejects evil. That person can be saved. They're saved through the grace of God, of course, but an extraordinary operation of that grace. The grace of baptism. What does baptism do for us? Well, there are different effects of the sacrament of baptism. And these are signified by the perceptible elements of the sacramental rite. You know, I spoke about that a little bit already, the, the pouring of water or the immersion in water, cleansing and regeneration. Baptism results in the forgiveness of all sins. In the case of an infant who doesn't have the use of reason and hence can't commit personal sin, original sin is wiped away. They're cleansed. In the case of an adult who may have committed all kinds of horrible sins. I once baptized a man who was reportedly a mafia chieftain, and he was 80 years old almost, or maybe he was 80 or thereabouts. Hadn't been baptized, which is odd, because most guys in the mafia grow up in Italian families, <laughs> and most of them were Catholic back in those days. And baptized him on his deathbed, and he died. Now, what about that guy? Well, he wanted baptism, and he got it, and it was valid. What happened? Original sin washed away. All of his personal sin washed away. The temporal punishment due to sin, purgatory, washed away. What happens? He gets on the elevator, and he goes straight up. And some would say, not fair. <laughs> I've been good all my life. How come I, I can't have it that easy? Well, I, I suggest you don't hold out. You, you know, in, in the early church, people actually at times used to wait until they got older in order to be baptized. You know, I, well, I can, I can well see it. Let's see. I'll have fun until I'm 35, and then I'll get baptized, and I'll be in good shape. But you don't know, you could get run over by a bread truck when you're 34, and then you would have a problem. And so baptism removes sin and all the effects of sin. Yet certain temporal consequences remain even after baptism. We know that we have a tendency towards sin. Even though baptism removes the guilt of sin, we still have a wounded nature. We're wounded as the result of original sin. Also, suffering, illness, and death, we still have, even after we're baptized, even after we're regenerated in new life in Christ. Even though we're baptized, we still are susceptible, vulnerable. We suffer temptation. We feel the pull, the attraction of sin. In Latin, that's called the fomes or concupiscence. Uh, that's like the tinder, the, the, the flame. You know, if you have dry... Tinder, I, I started a, a fire in the, the wood stove last week in the Hermitage. You know, you put dry wood and maybe papers and so forth, and, and that's very volatile, right? And, and it doesn't take much. All you have to do is a little spark, and it'll go up. And that's kind of how our fallen nature is. You know, a little spark sometimes of temptation. Oop, there we go. Fall right into it. Well, that's concupiscence. That's an effect of original sin. And so that remains. Uh, that God allows us to remain in that state so we can fight it out to the end. So we can run the race to the finish line, fight the good fight, and I'm going to tell you something, it gives glory to God. Temptations don't hurt your soul. Temptations can be used to sanctify your soul. St. Francis of Assisi was wont to say that temptation is like a ring with which God espouses the soul to himself. Temptation overcomes, not just temptation. Temptation overcomes is like an engagement ring that espouses the soul to God. Yes, we're tempted. Some of us tempted very violently. We're tempted maybe to anger, to violence. We're tempted uh, against purity. 
but by resisting the temptation, by remaining steadfast, we give glory to God. And that's a beautiful thing. And so God leaves us in that wounded state to fight it out with the enemy. You know, the spirit of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in so doing, we overcome the temptation. We're sanctified, purified, and one day glorified. Baptism incorporates us into the church. It makes us members of the mystical body of Christ. We share in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly dimension of Jesus Christ, who is priest, prophet, and king. So when we're baptized, we're brought into Jesus. He's the head of the church. We're the body, his church. We're not our own from that point on. Now, this is very important. Number 1269, we're not our own. Having become a member of the church, the person baptized belongs no longer to himself, but to him who died and rose for us. From now on, he is called to be subject to others, to serve them in the communion of the church, and to obey and submit to the church's leaders, holding them in respect and affection. And I tell you today, there are many who, if you explained that to them, would say, no thanks. I don't want to be subject to anyone else. I'm my own person. I'm not going to do that. I will not be subject to someone else. Well, we're not our own. We have been purchased, and at what a cost, the blood of God. And so he is our master, but you have to remember who your master is. And when Christ, God, is your master, you're free. He doesn't lord it over us. You know, you're not your own anyway. We think we are. In 20th century Western civilization, we think we're so free. Well, I can do whatever I want to do. I got to be free. I got to be me. I'm my own person. I did it my way. Listen, you're going to belong to God or you're going to belong to Satan because there are only two places you can go in the end, heaven and hell. Everybody in purgatory goes to heaven. And in the end, you have one of two masters. You can behold the beautiful face of Christ or the horrific face of Satan. But in the end, there's only two places you can go. And in the end, there are only two masters that you can have. And so do not deceive yourself by thinking you can be your own man. You will serve God or not in the end. That's the truth. That's doctrine. Don't water it down. Don't mess with it. And don't accept watering down from anyone else. Two places, heaven, hell. And God doesn't put us in either one. We choose freely. I've had a taste of both. Maybe you have too. I prefer heaven. I prefer God because he's a good master. And in him, you enjoy freedom, authentic freedom, the glorious freedom of the children of God. We have to give witness. When we're baptized, we're reborn, baptized as sons and daughters of God. And we have to profess before men, before the world, that we are, in fact, children of God. We participate in the apostolic and missionary work of the church. Baptism isn't some mere social event. You know how sad it is, how very sad it is for a good priest who has to witness in his parish very often people coming for baptism or marriage, whatever it might be, he knows they don't know their left hand from their right when it comes to what they're called to in the faith. Uh, you know, good priests suffer because of that. Oh, they do the best they can. You know, you try to teach the faith. You try to give witness. But in the end, you know, it's a social thing. And you have to do all you can to get the point across that this is a great blessing, but every blessing carries with it commensurate responsibilities. The greater the blessing, the greater the responsibility. What is our responsibility from baptism? No small thing. You are to become the living presence of Christ in the world. 
That isn't a minor thing. That is an enormous gift and an enormous responsibility. We are called to become great with the greatness of none other than the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. This is something that baptism bestows upon us. And we have to respond to that great gr grace with our whole heart, mind, and strength. The sacramental bond of the unity of Christians is found in baptism. We know that it's baptism that brings you into the church. There's only one church. There's only one God. He had only one son. He sent only one son who instituted one only church. No matter what denomination you are as a Christian, whether you're Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever, there's only one church. And it's valid baptism that brings us into the one church. And so that is a, a principle and basis for unity. I've told you before that some of my, my good Protestant friends, even some pastors, I'll say, oh, I'm so delighted that you're a member of my church. I'm so happy to be your brother in the one only church. And if they don't get it right away, what you're talking about, they... Some of them, especially the southern ones, they'll say, I ain't no Catholic. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love them very much, and, and I, think, I think they love me too. And then I say, well, look, there's only one Lord, one God, one Savior, one truth. Now, how is it he could have established more than one church? No, brother, you're right. There's only one church, only one church. Well, baptism is what makes us brothers and sisters with the same one only Father in heaven. And so baptism is that principle and basis for Christian unity. You know, you want to emphasize the positive. It's not good to emphasize the negative. You know, I bring up some of the negative things in teaching because you have to. Why? Because I don't know of any electrical pole that operates without the positive and the negative. You just have the positive, there isn't no power. You've got to have positive and negative. So I've got to emphasize the positive. But I've got to mention the negative so that you're aware of it so you won't step into it. I've got to mention the errors. I've got to mention the traps, the snares, the pitfalls. Why? Because I don't want you to fall into them. I want you to avoid them. So we mention the negative, but we emphasize the positive. And the positive is that baptism makes all Christians part of the same family. And so my Lutheran brothers and sisters are indeed my brothers and sisters. I have to care for them and love them. My Pentecostal brothers and sisters, I have to love them very much, and I have to care for them. And I'm going to tell you something. If I care for them, I want them to have the fullness of the truth, and I want them to have the full means of salvation. I want them to have seven sacraments, not one, not two, seven. Well, that is what the Lord gave us. And so if I love them, if I care for them, and I'd better, because they're my brothers and sisters, then I want the best for them. For what else is love other than to, to desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved? And so I desire them to be Catholic, Now, there are some who would say that that's very self-centered, but it's not. It's Christocentric. Jesus instituted the one only church. I want his will to be done. I don't have a better idea than the Lord Jesus. There was only one Christian church for over 15 centuries. The Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes. And if he did, then I don't want to be in it anyway. But he didn't. For 15 centuries, one only Christian church. It was only in the 16th century with the Reformation that the church began to fracture and splinter. And now we have over 20,000 Christian denominations and splinter groups. That fracturing, that division is sad. Often enough, it was the cause of men, caused by men on both sides. Very often, uh, it was our fault. Often it was the other side's fault. Never mind whose fault it was, the reality is God established one church, one shepherd, one flock. We have to long for that. Baptism 
is where it begins. As I said before, baptism imprints an indelible character on the soul, a mark, a seal. You're sealed with the sign of God. In ancient times, things that belonged to the king or to a kingdom were affixed with a seal, uh, like, kind of like a brand. You know, if, if you own cattle, you're a rancher, you might have a brand on those cattle. Well, the seal that baptism Confirmation and holy orders imprints indelibly on the soul. That means it can never go away. It's eternal. From the moment you're baptized, that seal imprinted on your being will never go away, even in eternity. Even in eternity. For your undying glory or your undying shame, whatever the case may be. The same with confirmation and holy orders, an indelible seal, an imprint basically says you belong to Christ, you are his, and that's a great thing to belong to Christ. I'm going to speak now about the sacrament of confirmation, also one of the sacraments of Christian initiation, and begin on number 1285. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation whose unity must be safeguarded. Now note that. Whose unity must be safeguarded. Those sacraments of Christian initiation, they constitute a unity. And that unity must be safeguarded. It must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. Now, that does not mean that you're not fully baptized if you're not confirmed. You're baptized. If you're baptized, you're baptized. But we're talking about the full operation of the grace of baptism. It requires confirmation to be completed. For by the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are enriched with a special strength of the Holy Spirit. Hence, they are, as true witnesses of Christ, more strictly obliged to spread and defend the faith by word and by deed. It's very important that we stress this point. You need confirmation. My sister's daughter, my niece, is going to have her little baby baptized. I'm going to do the baptism. I told you that. They've had difficulty finding sponsors uh, for the uh, baptism. For, because most of their friends aren't confirmed. Most of their friends aren't confirmed. And in that diocese, I, I'm not sure if it's a universal norm, it certainly makes sense, but at least one of the sponsors has to be a confirmed Catholic. And, and they can't seem to find one. Of all their friends, they have a lot of Catholic friends, but she's about 21, 22 now, and all of her group that she grew up with, she can't find one that's been confirmed. Now that tells you something. There are a great many people who are skipping this sacrament. There are a great many who are receiving it, but my pastor friends tell, tell me that very often after confirmation they never see the kids again. They're gone. That's a sad reality. That, that tells us something about the very unhappy state of affairs today. We want to make sure that we're confirmed. Now, if anyone here, just through circumstances, not your own fault, we don't blame anyone for that, maybe totally beyond uh, the scope of, of your ability in the past, in the past. You didn't get confirmed. Please get confirmed. You know, as an adult, uh, you can make arrangements, even that you may have been practicing your faith all along, you're a good Catholic, you go to Mass frequently, receive the sacraments, but you, never, you just never were confirmed. Make arrangements to get confirmed, because it says here that we have to explain to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. That's what it says, that's what it means, and so we pass that on. Let's talk about the economy of salvation in the sacrament of confirmation. 
we know that Jesus is called the Christ. That word Christ refers to the Messiah, the anointed. The Christ is the anointed. What is he anointed with? The Holy Spirit. Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Remember what happened at, at the baptism in the Jordan? John the baptizer baptized Jesus. By being baptized, Jesus baptized the waters. And then what happened? The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, came down upon Jesus. Well, he's the anointed one, the Messiah, anointed with the Holy Spirit. And so we, too, have to be as Christians, right? Christ meaning the anointed. As Christians, we're anointed. We're the anointed of Christ. That's what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. The head and the body have to be one. He's anointed. He shares his anointing. And the anointing is the Holy Spirit. This fullness of the Spirit is transmitted to the entire Messianic people. That's us people of the promise. Anointing with chrism or holy oil comes from the apostolic tradition of the laying on of hands. All right, Confirmation completes baptism and it perpetuates the grace of Pentecost in the church. Tomorrow we celebrate Pentecost. That's a major, major feast in the church. We commemorate and not only commemorate, but because it's liturgy, we make present, we enter into that mystery of Pentecost. All right, tomorrow we enter into that mystery of Pentecost. What happened? The Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and the Blessed Mother in the Cenacle. And what happened? Remember what, what, what they were like there? They were afraid. The doors were locked. They were afraid of the, the persecution of the Jews. Uh, they would get the Romans after them. They were afraid. They weren't boldly proclaiming the Lord Jesus, but then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. How did he come? He came as a driving wind and as tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit. He's a spirit of power and might, a spirit of courage. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the spirit which gives you the power to give witness. You're not afraid. You'll stand up to the whole world if necessary and proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you have to die for it, so much the better. And so the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And then what happened? They began to preach boldly. Peter proclaimed boldly that Jesus is the Messiah. Thousands were added to their number, 3,000 at one time. They weren't afraid. What did they do? They went out in the temple precincts day after day, and they preached the good news. And what happened? Oh, they, they, they dragged them in before the Sanhedrin. They threatened them. Don't mention that man's name again. And what did they do? They rejoiced for having been found worthy to suffer something for the name, the glorious name of Jesus, the Lord. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit does for you, and that is what confirmation does for you. Confirmation gives us an entrance into Pentecost. Confirmation should be a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it is. That's what happens. With that sacrament, the Holy Spirit's there. The grace of the sacrament is there. Why don't we see a powerful manifestation of it then? at confirmation. I'll tell you why. Because we enter into it half-heartedly, and our people aren't prepared for it properly. There should be a tremendous outpouring of grace when that sacrament is conferred. Some of you have been around the charismatic renewal. Let me tell you something. There shouldn't have been any need for a charismatic renewal. We should have had it all the time. The charismatic church is the original church the Catholic Church where the Holy Spirit is operating in all the charisms. What's a charism? A gift given to an individual for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the church, and confirmation, the laying on of hands, the anointing with chrism, the Holy Spirit should rush upon that person, fill them with power. The gift should be unlocked, and they should go forth to proclaim Christ. That grace is there. That grace is there. 
but it operates only in proportion to the disposition of the one receiving the sacrament. And if you aren't overly thrilled about being confirmed, then there isn't going to be a whole lot going on. You'll receive the sacrament. It'll be there. Sometimes you can, people are in a state of mortal sin. They receive the sacrament. Do they receive the sacrament if they are in mortal sin? Yes, but it's not operative. In a sense, the grace is not able to operate. The mark goes on the soul, but it doesn't work. You know, the grace of that specific sacrament, it's not operating. So let's say 14-year-old person, confirmed, goes to class Monday morning after Sunday, and the discussion comes out, do you feel that abortion is, is okay today? And everybody starts in with what's politically acceptable, politically correct. And most of the kids say, oh, well, a woman should have a right to choose and this and that. And the lo young Catholic person just confirmed because they weren't overly receptive to the reception of the sacrament, cowers and sits there and says nothing. And there isn't any outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Christ isn't proclaimed. And the faith isn't defended. And we wonder why. Well, the reason why is because we didn't help to dispose that person for the sacrament. The grace was there. The grace was there to give witness. That's what confirmation does. It strengthens us so that we can go forth and boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel. And when someone calls the truth a lie and exalts lies as though they were the truth, confirmation, if it is fully operative, will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to stand up to look right in the face of hell and say, this is the truth, and that's a lie. Jesus is Lord, and he's going to prevail. That's confirmation. That's power. That's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so we need to be working hard to help to dispose are people who are about to receive any sacrament to be open. And you know, one of the best ways to do it, a lot of people accuse me of just pounding the old law, you know, pounding the old doctrine and so forth. Let me tell you something. The law is important. I respect, I reverence the norms and rules and laws of the church. But I'm going to tell you something that's even more important. I love my Heavenly Father. I love Jesus the Lord. I have a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, I respect that which God has established, in which no man has the right to cast down. The relationship is not somehow diametrically opposed to the structure of the church. The charismatic church and the hierarchical church or the same church and the charismatic church and the hierarchical church have to live in peace. The charism's always subject to the hierarchy of the church, always obedient, always submissive, always saying, yes, Lord, here I am, come to do your will. And so with confirmation or any sacrament, we come to do God's will. We come to receive the grace that sanctifies us the grace of the Holy Spirit, which helps us to become who we are as Christians and as human beings. And the human being who follows Jesus Christ, the perfect human being, himself or herself, becomes more human. That's what the sacraments do for us. They help to Christianize us, and in being Christianized, we are humanized. You see what's happened in the world especially in our society. As we've de-Christianized society, we have dehumanized society. And I assure you, if you would like to guarantee the demise of this society, allow it to be de-Christianized even more. Allow the sanctity, the holiness, to be drained out of the church, because you know it is Christianity that holds the world in being. It is Christianity that keeps this world from sinking right into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. That's what Christianity does for the world. 
It holds the world in being. And so we want to be more intense in our Christianity. Confirmation is a great sacrament that helps us to do just that. Now there are two traditions. I mentioned this before, one in the East and one in the West. In the East, in most of the Eastern Rites, babies are confirmed at the same time that they are baptized. However, in the West, we separated this. There's, there's still a union. We still try to preserve and remind ourselves of the unity between baptism, confirmation, and indeed the Eucharist, the three sacraments of initiation. Now, the elements of this sacrament. Well, we know there's an anointing with oil. Well, what about oil? Well, we know something about oil in the natural order. Oil is a sign of abundance and joy in Scripture. Oil cleanses an anointing before and after a bath. It limbers the anointing of athletes and wrestlers. We know that oil is a sign of healing since it soothes, uh, it gives a soothing effect to bruises and wounds. And it makes radiant with beauty and health. So that, that's just kind of the natural sense of, of the element of oil. Now in the sacramental life, the anointing with oil indicates those same things, right? Sense perceptible signs which effect what they signify. So the oil strengthens us. The oil can heal us. The, the anointing at confirmation results in a strengthening of the person. The oil at the anointing of the sick results in a healing, a spiritual healing, a comforting, a strengthening of that person to meet their sickness and even death if necessary. By confirmation, Christians, meaning those who are anointed, share more completely in the mission of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Holy Spirit with which he is filled. And then we are sent. We're strengthened through confirmation, and then we share more fully in the mission of Christ. The mission of Christ is what? Redemption. How did he effect redemption? On a cross. What should confirmation do? It should strengthen us and fill us with courage to embrace the cross. And if you're going to be rejected for your Catholic faith, you need to be strong. Some people aren't, and they'd rather satisfy their friends and family members and do away with their faith, or limit it, or impoverish it, or diminish it. But that's not the thing to do. If the grace of confirmation is operating, no matter what the cost, you're going to stand tall for Christ. You're going to go forth with the power of the confirmed. What are you confirmed in? You're confirmed in the grace of baptism. You're confirmed in Christ. You're confirmed in the faith. You're confident, and you're not afraid. And if the devil himself comes against you, you're going to put him to flight because you are in Christ, and Jesus is the victor. And so we are sealed with the Holy Spirit at confirmation, and it marks us as belonging totally to Christ, and you don't have to be afraid of anything, including death itself. The celebration of confirmation is very important. The consecration of the sacred chrism, or the myron, as it is called in the Eastern Rites. The Eastern Rites call confirmation chrismation. I mentioned that once before. The prayer in the Syriac liturgy of Antioch expresses the epiclesis for the consecration of the sacred chrism, or myron, in a very beautiful way. The Catechism uh, notes it, and I'm just going to read it because it it indicates something very beautiful, a beautiful expression. Some of the Eastern rites have magnificent, magnificent wording and expression in their liturgies. This is the Epiclesis, the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Father, send your Holy Spirit on us and on this oil, which is before us, and consecrate it, so that it may be for all who are anointed and marked with it, holy myron, priestly myron, royal myron, anointing with gladness, clothing with light, a cloak of salvation, a spiritual gift, the sanctification of souls and bodies, imperishable happiness, the indelible seal, a buckler of faith, and a fearsome helmet against all the works of the adversary. That's the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the holy oil. 
that you're anointed with in, in the Eastern Rite, the Syriac liturgy of Antioch. And we have a similar invocation or epiclesis of the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon that oil. Now, the essential rite for us, most of us in the Latin Rite is done by the bishop, usually. It can be a priest who is given the faculty by the bishop, but it's an anointing with sacred chrism on the forehead. It's done, the bishop lays his hand and anoints the forehead, and he says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the Eastern churches, uh, the more significant parts of the body, like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chest, are also anointed. And, and there is a, a slightly different wording, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But in any event, the anointing with oil and the words be sealed with the Holy Spirit are the form and matter of the sacrament, the essential part of the rite. Now, I've mentioned some of the effects of confirmation. It roots us more deeply in the divine filiation, which makes us cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, it makes us more fervently sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. It unites us more firmly to Christ, the head of the church. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit within us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect, and it gives us special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action. Like baptism, which it completes, confirmation is given only once. Those sacraments which imprint that indelible seal that I mentioned, they can never be repeated. Those sacraments are baptism, confirmation, holy orders. Those three sacraments imprint that indelible character or seal upon the soul. Now, who can receive Confirmation. Well, every baptized person, not yet confirmed, can and should receive the sacrament of confirmation. To complete Christian initiation, the faithful are obliged to receive confirmation at the appropriate time. Now, I've mentioned how important preparation for confirmation is. We should do all that we can to be prepared to receive this sacrament or to help others be prepared to receive that great sacrament. Uh, number one, in very least, you have to be in a state of grace, of course. It is a profanation to receive a sacrament not in a state of grace. As I said, even if you aren't in a state of grace and you are confirmed, well, the sacrament is received, but the grace and the fruits don't operate until you go to confession, and then that resuscitates the grace of the sacrament, and then that grace operates. And, you know, so that, that's very important. In a way, I, I can see some of the wisdom of the Eastern churches where they confirm the babies, you know. Uh, I can see our wisdom in the Western church, too, of being catechized before we receive the sacrament to know what we're receiving, so there are arguments on both sides. So in addition to being in a state of grace, though, we want to have an intense spiritual life. You want to pray more. Prayer, fasting, works of mercy, exercise of charity, you should do this on your way towards confirmation. Why? To dispose yourself for the Holy Spirit. I've been doing this for the last several days for tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's Pentecost. Uh, I know I receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, at confirmation, at holy orders. I know the Holy Spirit's one with Jesus, who we receive in the Eucharist. But I'm, I'm constantly striving to be better disposed to receive the Holy Spirit all the more. I need him. I can't do anything without that Spirit of the living God who leads us in to all the truth. The minister of confirmation, finally, is the bishop, normally. In the East, however, the Eastern Rite, normally the priest does the confirmation at the time of baptism. We've preserved uh, the bishop doing it in the Latin Rite uh, because that's the way it was in the beginning. But a priest can do it if the bishop gives him the faculty to do it. However, it's always the bishop who consecrates 
the sacred chrism or the holy myron, as they call it in the East. Always the anointing is done with the oil which is blessed by the bishop, whether it's in the East or the West. Any Christian who's in danger of death should be confirmed, and any priest can do that for him. Any priest can administer the sacrament of confirmation when someone is in danger of death, and they should receive that sacrament if you have time to do it. So we've talked about the sacraments in general. We've talked about baptism and confirmation. And in the final hour, uh, I'm going to attempt to talk about what I consider the single most important thing that I'm going to talk about in this course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Blessed Eucharist, the source, the center, the summit of our Christian life. 